Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. This week, Flanders on Sunday lived up to expectations, so I'll look back on how the men's and women's Tour of Flanders were won, plus exactly what happened to Tadej Pogacar. We've also got Dwarz Dor Vlandren, the Grand Prix Miguel Indurain, and I'm going to look ahead at what we've got coming up on GCN+. Plus. <laughs> This week in the world of racing, we learnt that Victor Kampenarts gritted his teeth so hard at Dwarsdorf Landren, he chipped one. Thankfully, he had 58 teeth on his big chainring to make up for it. Uh, we also learnt this week that a bike can puncture whilst it's on the top of a team car. This is Dylan van Baler getting on his spare, only to find he had a flat front tyre. He did go on to have a great race though. And finally, we learnt that Tadej Pogacar rode most of the race on Sunday without any numbers to look at. His head unit fell off in the first hour of the race and was found by ex-pro and current photographer Leon van Bon. On to the race though, and I'm going to go through it play by play over on the touchscreen. The first real piece of action from the day came with 91 kilometers to go over the top of the Berendries, and this is where Ivan Garcia Cortina goes on the attack for Movistar, drawing a very strong group clear with him. If I pause it just here, you'll see that there are two riders from Quickstep Alpha Vinyl, Stebar and Steimler. Group Arma have a rider in there. Ben Turner's there for the Ineos Grenadiers. Uh, Nathan van Hoydon has been swept up from his earlier attack. Trek Segafredo represented, and eventually, so are Alpes and Phoenix. That was a really important move there by Gianni Vermeersch, because behind, Quickstep Alpha Vinyl and some other teams are already starting to block the road, and Pogaccia, who's just down there, is blocked in. So UAE Team Emirates have nobody in what ends up being quite a large and a very strong group going off the front at a crucial point within the race. Luckily for them, Bahrain Victorious had also missed it, Ad had Lotto Sudal, and they were really important to UAE Team Emirates in trying to chase that group back down. Uh, the next major climb was the Berg 10 Outer. At this point, you can see UAE Team Emirates and Matteo Trentin taking matters into their own hands. Victor Campenart's on his wheel, there's Asgreen, and there is Mathieu van der Poel. Now he uploaded his file to Strava after the race yesterday, complete with power data, and this climb was his peak one minute power, 732 watts, but we didn't see too much of what was happening with the main favorites at this point in the race. Looking at the power though, it must have been blooming hard. Now you can see over the top here, this is the counter-attack group, including Ben Turner's, Denix Debar, etc. The move behind has almost made contact, but it never quite does. And we'll see that from the aerial shots in a few moments time. I thought during commentary that this was the point at which Pidcock had caught that counter-attack move. But if we look closer, it's actually Van der Poel there, and there's still some distance in front of him to that move. So Van der Poel and Bogatja still with some time and distance to make up. Now the next crucial point of the race came on the Hour de Quaramont. This was absolutely incredible. At the top of your screen there, that is Tadej Pugaccio going past that counter-attack move with some very strong riders like their juniors or amateur riders. The speed differential was absolutely incredible. But for me, this is where Kasper Asgreen lost the race. He had to go so deep to stay on the back wheel of Tadej Pogacar over the top of the Alder Quaramont that I don't think he was ever the same rider again for the rest of the race. For me, his mechanical problem didn't really make too much difference to his outcome and to his result. What's also interesting though on the Alder Quaramont on this second passage is that Mathieu van der Poel is a reasonable way back. If I pause it just here, that's Tom Pidcock, that is Mathieu van der Poel. Now, I'm not sure if he was out of position or just trying to save his energy and hide in the wheels, but nevertheless, this climb of the Quaramont was his peak five minute power from the race. I think it was about 530 watts, which just goes to show you, Pugaccia must have been putting out some serious power. Uh, on to the next clip, which is the next climb, and that is the Paterberg. I'm gonna pause it just as they go around this corner, just to highlight where Kasper Asgreen is. Not a bad position, I think he would have liked to have been a few positions further up, but 12th place going into the Paterberg at this stage in the race is not bad at all. But we're about to see him starting to really suffer and pay for the effort that he made on the previous climb. If I pause it just in a few moments time, we've seen the big favorites go through. Dylan van Baal here of Ineos Grenadiers is the last rider to latch onto the back of that group. And then there's already a gap opening up to the rider from B&B Hotels and that is Kasper Asgreen with a huge grimace just a few moments behind. On to the next clip, and I'm going to highlight this really important position in between the foot of the Paterberg descent and the hardest climb of the day, which is the Koppenberg. 
Now, this is the point where everyone looks around, assesses the situation, sees which teams have numbers and which teams don't. And at that point, it can be the perfect moment to go. And Dylan van Baal does this on a regular basis at the Tour of Flanders. He decides to go on the attack, and you'll see that Fred Wright of Bahrain Victorias is the only rider to react to that and go with him. It's a brilliant move for both of them because what it means is that when we get to the Koppenberg itself, they've got a nice handy 21 second advantage going into this steep climb over the group that's just come around that corner there. That means that they can go up this at their own tempo, not go too deep into the red, and more importantly, get caught by the elite front group ahead of what's to come. Behind them, Kasper Asgreen, through the help of his teammates, has managed to get himself back on and onto the front of the main body of the peloton, or what's left of it. But you'll notice as I move it on that he's already losing ground on Tadej Pogacar when he makes yet another acceleration. So, once we get to this next bit where they go over the top of the 20% gradients of the Koppenberg, you can see that we've got Pogacar here at the front, Van der Poel and Madwas, the only riders really able to follow him. We move on a little bit further, you can see that Kasper Asgren is a long way back already. So yes, he had a mechanical problem. I think he dropped his chain whilst trying to go into the big ring. But for me, that doesn't make any difference to his race whatsoever. He stopped at the side of the road here, but that man is really suffering at this point in the race. I'm gonna move it on to the Tyenberg now, which is where the junction is made. In fact, I'm gonna to have to go over to the other side of the screen for the next clip. This is where the junction is made between Van der Poel, Pogacar and Valentin Madwas and the two riders that have gone up the road, they being Fred Wright and Dylan Van Baal. Now this period was 13 minutes of incredible power for Mathieu Van der Poel and you can assume the two riders that he was with. 438 watts for 13 minutes from the foot of the Koppenberg to this point which is over the top of the Tyenberg, or the Bonenberg, as it's often seen. Uh, now this means that we've got five riders together at the front of the race and this is how it stays until we get onto the final climb of the Alder Quaramont. Pogacar back to doing what he'd done on so many previous climbs, going as hard as he could at the front of the race. And you can see that the only man able to go with him, much of Van der Poel of Alpes in Phoenix, and the gap already opening up to Madwas, Fred Wright and Dylan van Baal a little bit further back. And so at this point, we all thought it's just going to be down to the two of them, especially with what we saw here at the final climb of the day, the Paterberg. Now you can see there is a small gap opening up between Pogacar and Van der Poel. We all thought maybe this is the point where Pogacar wins the race. But what I think happens is that Van der Poel had been trying to ride on this very narrow but much smoother part on the side of the road. He'd lost his balance, lost a bit of speed, and so he had to close that very small one or two meter gap back to the back wheel of today Pogacar. So two go over the top of the Paterberg together. Normally it's the first over the top that wins, not the case this year. Let's move on to the sprint. And we've actually got it side by side with the race from 12 months ago. Asgreen versus Van der Poel and Van der Poel versus Pogacar. At least that's what we thought was going to be the case. But if I roll it on in just a few minutes time, a few seconds time, they've gone so slow on the run in and that has allowed these two, Madwas and also Dylan Van Baal, to come back at them with a lot more speed. So whilst Van der Poel kicks towards the line with over 1400 watts, the other two have got them up close. Now you can see that Van, that Van Baal here, he's got clear air in front of him, but he wants to get onto the wheel of Mathieu Van der Poel to get into the slipstream, give him the best possible chance of trying to come round him before the line. And with Madwas here as well, it means that Pogacar eventually has nowhere to go. I don't think that Dylan Van Baal did anything wrong here at all. He didn't sway dramatically over to the side of the road, but he did just go into the slipstream of Mathieu van der Poel. Pogacar, you saw there, incredibly angry and disappointed, but I think mainly with himself. Let's just whiz that back again, because I had a theory that van der Poel had learnt from last year. I thought that he'd started last year's sprint from a higher pace, and he knew that if he wanted to win, he really wanted to kick from a lower pace, because very few people can match him. But actually, when we have it side by side, the speed was almost exactly the same. From 250 metres to go, all the way to the line, uh, Van der Poel and on the left-hand side, Askreen, from that point, they crossed the line at almost exactly the same moment. So I think the speed was almost exactly the same. It's just that this year, Mathieu Van der Poel had more left in the legs to continue his sprint all the way to the finish line. An absolutely brilliant race. I love analysing it. And incidentally, that last climb of the Paterberg, 1 minute and 10 seconds at 650 watts for Mathieu Van der Poel. He had power to spare yesterday.
So, a second monument victory for Van der Poel, 18 months after he last won the Ronda, and his record of consistency in the monuments of cycling is staggering. Fourth, 13th, 10th, 6th, 1st, 5th, 2nd, 3rd, 3rd, and 1st on Sunday. For Van Bala, that was his first time on the podium of a monument in 20 attempts, whilst Madois became the first Frenchman on the podium in 25 years, and only the fourth French rider on the podium in the last 30. Now, Pogaccia was obviously disappointed and made his anger at Van Baal clear to him after the line. However, once the dust had settled, he did say that he was more angry with himself than with anyone else. His result, though, is yet another indication that he is capable of winning pretty much every race in the sport of cycling. He's been in the top five of the last five monuments in which he has started. And according to Killian Kelly, today Pogaccia is the first rider to finish in the top five of Liège, Lombardy, Milano, San Remo and Flanders consecutively in that order since Sean Kelly did it in 1985 and 1986. But after that run, uh, Kelly started the Tour of the Basque Country the following day and won that overall too. Absolutely bonkers. Uh, Kelly would also do Paris-Roubaix each season, and Pogaccia took to Twitter yesterday to say, see you at Paris-Roubaix, with a question mark though. Now, I'm pretty sure he was joking, but you never know your luck. Van der Poel's victory does mean that Belgium have had their longest ever drought when it comes to victories at the Men's Tour of Flanders. And in fact, this was their worst ever edition of the race. Only one rider in the top 10, and that was Dylan Thurns. It was a much better race in the women's for them though, which I'm going to move on to now. So it's time to head back over to the touchscreen. First major point for the women's race was the Koppenberg, which was included for the very first time in their race this year, which was fantastic to see. But it meant there was an immense fight to get into it in the front positions. I'm going to pause it just here and highlight where a few of the major teams are. Uh, Mariana Voss with Jumbo Visma and a whole host of her teammates on the right-hand side of the road here. We've got Movistar for Van Fleurten and Norsgaard with one or two teammates around here. Uh, Balsamo along with her compatriot and teammate Elisa Longo Bulgini for Trek Segafredo on the left hand side of the road. What's interesting here is that SD Works are quite a way back. Uh, this is Marlon Rusa with one of her teammates. We've got two more SD Works riders including Demi Vollering here and Lotta Kopecki, the Belgian national champion, on her own trying to find position at the front. I looked at this and I was a little bit worried about where they would be on the run in uh, to the Koppenberg but I needn't have been worried because I move it on to the start of the climb proper, we can see that they found position at the front of the race. If I pause it just here, we've got Van Vleurten. Everyone knows what she's about to do, unleash a searing attack and go as hard as she possibly can on the steepest slopes of the day, over 20%. But we've got Marlon Rusa, Swiss champion, Demi Vollering, fresh from altitude, and Lotta Kopecki, who is glued to the back wheel of Van Flirten for almost the entire race. So numerical superiority at this point for SD Works. However, I've got to say that Movistar also did a really great ride yesterday. I've got Van Flirten there, but a little bit further back, Emma Norsgaard, she is just distance, but this group comes together over the top. And just on the wheel there, you can see the helmet of Arlene Sierra, also of Movistar. And so what that means is that over the top of the Koppenberg and down the descent, when this group comes together, we've got three riders from SD Works, but we've also got three from Team Movistar, along with a couple of other riders, including Elisa Longo Borghini. Now, if I go on to the next clip, this is also really interesting. So I talked about in the men's race, the fact that between the major climbs, there's a bit of hesitation. That's often where a strong move can go up the road. And that's exactly what we see here. So we've got two riders from major teams. Mahlerus, the Luxembourg national champion from SD Works, Arlena Sierra of Team Movistar. Nobody there though from Trek Segafredo. And if I move it on, even when four more riders go from this group, none of them go with that move. It's a really strange one because they've got Balsamo, Ellen van Dijk and Elisa Longo Borghini all in this group. My only conclusion is that they just didn't quite have the legs on the day, but it meant that they were really very much on the back foot. Now, if I move it on to the next clip, this is the start of the Alder Klausberg. And you can see that that group that's gone up the road now has almost a one minute advantage over the group of Van Flirten behind. Kasia Nubidoma also here representing Canyon SRAM, as well as Anna Henderson representing Jumbo Visma. However, Movistar clearly aren't content with having Arlena Sierra in that group. So Van Flirten back on the attack, glued to her wheel, 
Lotta Kopecky. Now, it's quite an amazing acceleration that she makes because you can already see there it's down to 24 seconds from 53. Over the top, she continued with her attack and she manages it to get, to get it down to a minimum of 16 seconds. However, she is unable to completely close the gap to those front group of riders. And so, when Marlon Russe finally catches back up to Van Vleurt and her teammate Kopecky, she goes on the attack with 27 kilometers to go and she eventually bridges up to the front group. It's quite a long chase, but you can see her here just latching on on the Ronde van Vlaanderen strat four kilometers after that attack. So a big effort that she's had to make there. It means that she joins up though with her teammate Christine Macherus and she drives it on the front and increases the gap from 15 seconds back up towards half a minute. That was a really important team job by the Luxembourg national champion. Once she is finally done, Marlon Rusa takes over on the outer quadrant on the steepest slopes here. And what you will see is that the only rider from this group that's able to go with Marlon Rusa is the Australian Brodie Chapman riding for FDJ Nouvelle Aquitaine. A brilliant ride, I've got to say, from the Australian rider here. So one SD works rider off the front with FDJ and behind, Van Flurten's at it again. Guess who stuck to her wheel? Lotta Kopecky, the Belgian national champion. And behind her, two more riders from SD Works, Chantal van der Broek Black and Demi Voro. And there are gaps there, but once again, so many numbers for them at the very head of the race. Right, I'll move it on now to the final climb of the day, which is the Putterberg, just as it is for the men's race. Through sheer grit, determination, and an awful lot of power, Van Flurten's got herself back on terms with Marlon Rousseau, but over the top, she'll find herself outnumbered again, because also there, glued to her wheel, as you would expect, is Lotta Kopecky. And just in the background, Chantal Vandenbroek Black, slightly distanced, but she does manage to get her way back to the front over the top of this Putterberg climb. There we can see Kasia Nubidoma and Brody Chapman also there or thereabouts. They come together, and this is the point at which Vandenbroek Black, former winner of this race, decides to go on the attack. And there's some initial hesitation from the non-SD works riders within this group. However, we do eventually have a counter move to try and catch back on. And yes, you've guessed it, it comes from Annemiek van Vleurten, twice a former winner of this race and riding it for Mobistar. So, with just under 10 kilometers of the race remaining, we are left with a situation where we've got two riders from SD Works, Van der Black, Otto Kopecky, and in the middle there, the former world champion, Annemiek van Flurten. And that is how it stays until the end of the race. If I move back over to the other side of the touchscreen, and a couple of kilometers further on, 6.6 k's to go, they've slowed down and they can't really afford to because the gap's still fairly slender, just 20 seconds to the group that is behind them. But understandably, Van Flurten is not willing to go full gas in this group and really drive the pace. So a quick discussion here from Kopecky with her teammate Chantal Vandenbroek Black. And I think eventually the team car calls from behind and they make the decision that Vandenbroek Black is going to drive things on the front with Kopecky and Van Flurten on their wheel. They're backing Kopecky's sprint at the end. I thought at the time that this was a bit of a gamble and that they should play the numbers game, but in the end, they made the right decision. Once we come to the sprint here, you will see that Van Flurten goes just inside 250 meters to go. Kopecky immediately reacts and with her kick, she immediately starts going faster than Van Flurten and she has time to post up and celebrate before the line. The perfect team tactics from ST Works throughout the entire important part of the Tour of Flanders. You've got to take your hat off to them, that was brilliant. And so Kopecky becomes only the second Belgian winner in the 19 editions of the women's race. Grace Verbecker being the other one back in 2010. Now she's had a real coming of age this season, Kopecky, and also isn't having the same bad luck that seemed to follow her in all of the major races last year. And I think this win is also massive in Belgian cycling, who have strangely few pro riders on the women's side of the sport. That win also marked the third at the Tour of Flanders in the last five years for SD Works, who were first, third and fifth on the day itself. My rider of the day, though, was Brody Chapman of FDJ. She made all the right moves on the day and she only turned pro back in 2018 when she won the Herald Sun Tour whilst training and racing around a full-time job. She is 30 now, but do not be surprised if she continues to improve over the next few years. Uh, just before I move on from Flanders, I wanted to thank all of you who gave us such positive feedback on our latest film, How to Win Flanders. Obviously, I had a great time out there filming it, especially in the brewery, uh, but it is lovely to read so many nice comments. Massive thanks to the team that put all of that together. I think I was basically the smallest cog in the wheel for that one. 
Uh, four days previous to Flanders, we had the race across it, Dwarz Dor Vlandrin. The women's race ended up in a sprint from quite a large group, won by Chiara Consoni of Valcal Travel and Service. Another younger Italian who was doing a great job of filling the gap left after Elisa Balsamer moved to Trek. In the men's, the final 10Ks was full of attacks from the small front group, but the one that stuck came from Tish Bernot. The problem for him was that Van der Poel bridged and the Belgian was no match for him in the sprint to the line. Meanwhile, down in Spain, the Grand Prix Miguel Indurain was forced to change its route due to overnight snowfall, avoiding most of the major climbs. But we still had that incredibly steep one on the final circuits. And after the final time up it, Pierre Latour and Alexander Vlasov had a gap. But they were caught by a number of riders on the technical run into the finish, including eventual winner Warren Barguil of Arkea Samsic. He's definitely back on form at the moment, isn't he? Uh, he just edged out Vlasov in the sprint with Simon Clark in third. And what a signing Clark has been for Israel Premier Tech. He's been their standout rider of the season for me so far. Right then, what's coming up on GCN Plus this week? Well, it's a combination of stage racing, one day classics, and documentaries. Uh, the Julia tour of the Basque Country kicks off today, and actually the opening time trial is likely to have finished by the time this video is released. Roglic, Vinegar, Avonapool, Martinez, Igita, Alaphilippe, and Adam Yates will be amongst those vying for the general classification in what is a notoriously tough six-day race that often doesn't see the best weather conditions. It is live and on demand every single day on GCN Plus in all territories. On Wednesday, we have the Scale de Prez. Uh, the women's race is live on that one for the very first time. That's normally the final race before Paris Bay, but this year, due to the date change, it comes before Amstel Gold Race on Sunday. Not a monument, of course, but not far off. But it's going to be interesting to see the start list for the men's race, given that a lot of riders who competed at the Basque Country normally take part, but presumably won't do this time around. Uh, those one-day races are available throughout Europe, plus the Asia-Pacific, excluding China, New Zealand and Australia. Also starting on Sunday is the eight-day tour of Turkey, where Nara Quintana is the standout GC contender. The provisional start list also includes a whole host of top sprinters, including Ewan, Buani, Groves and Bennett. We've got a lot for, of extra content for you this week on GCN Plus as well. Back on Track is a five-part series that follows the rise through the inaugural Track Champions League. Episode one is released tomorrow, and it follows the Dutch superstar Harry Lovrason and his tussle with his best friend and biggest rival, Jeffrey Hoagland. Uh, we also look at an unlikely alliance from two youngsters in the women's scratch race that takes the rest of the competitors off guard. Here's a sneak peek. You just don't know what's right or wrong. We are still friends after, which is really important. Coming up to the bell now. Some really can't handle it. Look at that step. Oh, they're down, they're down into Jeunesse. This is track cycling as you have never seen it before. We will be releasing the rest of that series over the coming weeks. Also out this week, though, is our latest Cycling Changed My Life episode. Uh, this time it follows Ottilie Quince. Let's play a trailer of that for you now. Ottilie's achieved a huge amount inside the world of, of transplant cycling. She's travelled to Argentina, South Africa, Sweden, and she's a world champion. I've managed to win 35 medals in 35 races. 11 of them gold medals at, at World Transplant Games. She just doesn't lose. Hola. She's been good for cycling and cycling has been good for her. Cycling came into my life at the right time. For me, it's completely saved my life. It really has just opened up a whole new world. Great stuff. So much to watch at the moment to do with cycling, isn't there? Now, the only other piece of news I've got for you this week is that Tom Pidcock has signed a contract extension at Team Ineos that will see him remain with the team until at least the end of 2027. So he's joining Pogaccia as a rider in the pro peloton to have such a long contract. Right, that is all for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back again in seven days' time to round up the men's and women's Amstel gold races and the tour of the Basque Country. For now, though, I shall bid you a fond farewell. <laughs>